Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so today we are having a very interesting panel discussion with six fabulous women, uh, Polish women uh, today. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are just uh, getting people in now. Um, but before we start, I just uh, wanted to give you a reminder that uh, this is going to be um, a webinar presented by this wonderful ladies. If you have any questions, you can ask your questions towards the end or any any time, basically during the panel discussion. I'm going to be uh, answering your questions towards the end of the discussion. Um, I think that's that's it for me, um, and I'm going to pass it on to Eva, who's going to be our wonderful um, moderator for today. Thank you so much, Andrea, and welcome, everyone. Um, Andrea, you're right. Uh, we have some heavy-duty, wonderful Polish ladies who are going to tell us about other Polish ladies, but before I start... I wanted to remind everyone that today we are celebrating uh, the Polish Heritage Month um, and it's a great initiative by the Embassy of the uh, Republic of Poland um, and I think this is the fifth year running. Uh, it is our third year of being involved and as everybody in the world has had to pivot, um, be agile or whatever the newest uh, term is, so have we and this is why we're doing this um, event online today. Um, let me introduce uh, our guest speakers. Um, there's somebody else that's going to be joining us um, at the end, but um, we have um, Katarzyna Rybka Iwańska from um, Israel, from Tel Aviv. Hello to you, Katarzyna. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce Hi. to you is another Katarzyna, or Kate Bogusławska. She is from London. Mm -hmm. Hello there, Kate. Um, we also have uh, Olga Topol um, at the bottom of your screen, I think. Hello, Olga. And last but certainly not least, um, we are introducing, I'm introducing to, to you Ivana Galinska, also from London. Hi, everyone. Uh, we Hi. are going to be um, showing um, a couple of presentations in a moment, but firstly, let me um, introduce you once again to someone that I feel very inspired on because she's got a massive social media following. I have been um, uh, watching her webinars and listening to um, her very inspirational um, talks online for quite some time, so I'm, I feel very privileged and a little bit shy. Uh, but Katarzyna, tell us um, what you do and who is your inspirational lady, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here today. And I was very uh, excited to actually um, to receive the invitation to join uh, today's event and to speak about the inspirational Polish women because it's, uh, it's actually the first meeting with such a title uh, that I'm invited to. And there are so many inspirational women and so many stories to be told and shared. And I'll be very happy to do it today. Uh, I'm speaking about many stories because I usually I, uh, I share many stories uh, about Polish women uh, precisely on my YouTube channel, uh, Pauline, Polish, uh, Poland in Hebrew, um, which I mean, I'm trying to explain Poland and, and Polish history and um, Polish identity in a way and Polish culture through the stories of Polish women. Um, because why not? <laughs> Usually we, we tell the history of our country in majority, actually, through the history of, of Polish, uh, uh, through, through the history of Polish men and the, their achievements. And I would like to draw the attention to the achievements of the Polish women, too. And since I'm a diplomat, because I, I work, uh, I, I live in Israel now because of my service uh, at the embassy of Poland in Tel Aviv. Um, I wanted to draw the attention of, of our audience here and also our my audience, as you said, I'm, I'm being followed by some people on, on social media, not only from Israel. So I wanted to draw the attention also to the Polish women active in diplomacy, because that's 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 my passion. That's my career. And I really wanted to uh, to share their stories. And apparently when I when I started exploring that issue, I discovered that uh, we do not speak that much about them. I mean, I didn't think about that in the past, but uh, I decided um, to actually or make a kind of a spin-off of my usual 
Polish Women Project uh, and to, draw, uh, to, to speak about the stories of Polish women involved in diplomacy. Now, usually we say that, we, we say that diplomacy used to be uh, a man's wealth, meaning that you know, there were no women in, in diplomacy and there were no women in Polish diplomacy, which is, as we say it in Hebrew, stuyat, meaning that it's um, zdura, <laughs> it's ah. nonsense. Uh, it's uh, because there were many and there are even more, of course, today. And that's why, you know, there are so many Polish female ambassadors right now. Uh, I have just recently read a, a wonderful piece in British Vogue about uh, British um, female ambassadors. I totally recommend you all to read it. And we have many as well today. And we used to have many Polish women involved in diplomacy in the past. Uh, not only in the role of diplomats, because that was really tough, but it, uh, in majority in the role of uh, disposers of diplomats. And this is the role that has been, um, that we need to draw more attention to. Also today, the disposers of diplomats have very important role to play. And they used to be very important also in the past. And my um, her heroine for today is Sofia Romer. She was exactly the spouse of one of our uh, most outstanding diplomats uh, of the interwar period and World War II period. Sofia Romer had a wonderful and very interesting and inspirational biography herself. Um, as a wife and a mother of three wonderful daughters uh, on the one hand, and also as a person herself. She had wonderful stamina, she had wonderful energy. She was um, sometimes very spontaneous, sometimes very like energetic, sometimes um, like the, the things that she was saying were so precise. And, you know, like if she was a professional diplomat, she would like sing with them when exactly when, when it was needed. Uh, but starting from the, from the beginning, why is Ofia Romer? And she's like my top of the top, uh, if, if I can say that, heroines. She was, um, she was coming from a noble family. Her, her family name was Vankovic. And she was a cousin of Melchior Vankovic, um, oh, you know, one, one, of, one of the most right. uh, famous writers and reporters. Um, and, you know, like in, in the history, when actually he based one of his stories on her diaries. And there he's saying, based on the story of Zofia, and it's going to be in Polish, Zofia um, Tadeuszowa Romerowa z Vankowiczu, meaning that Zofia Tadeusz Romer from the family of Vankovic, right? So, so uh, she was coming from a noble family, but her husband's surname was the most important at some point, obviously, and her husband's uh, passion and, and, um, and work and service for the, for the state of Poland as well. Uh, and um, the story that actually Melchior Vankovic uh, wrote on the basis of her diaries was extremely, is extremely important. I, maybe some of you uh, saw the movie, um, The Gates of Europe, Brota Europe from 1990, 1999. It's mm -hmm. about the hospital in, uh, in Cichinice and Zofia is featured in this movie. In, it's, she's the main character uh, of the movie. Uh, she's played by, by Alicia Bachleda Tsurus and together with two friends, uh, several friends from, you know, there were sisters of Mercy in a, in a hospital that was attacked um, during World War I by the Bol Bolsheviks and they were um, very brave there. Uh, they were trying to save the lives of remaining soldiers that, uh, who were treated in the hospital and they were try trying to bury the bodies of the soldiers that were killed by the Bolsheviks. Afterwards, she received the, the crosses of valor, so the official decoration for, you know, for her bravery, for you know, doing very brave things. And when she was then the spouse of a diplomat, she was, um, you know, on, at the diplomatic receptions, she was wearing wonderful uh, gowns, wonderful dresses, and she was having this cross of valor here. And everybody was amazed, you know, that she's not just a spouse, as people sometimes like to say, but she's a very brave spouse with a military decoration. Um, and she met, uh, then she was a courier um, in the 19, um, after World War I, she was a, a Polish courier working in the office of the Polish um, uh, representatives in the free city of Dines. So she's, she was carrying, you know, very important info uh, and insights from Gdańsk to Warsaw. Um, that was not easy neither. Then she was a, 
um, employee, a very promising employee, the chief of staff of the commercial attaché of the embassy of France in Warsaw. And she received many decorations from the, from the state of France. But when she met Tadeusz Romer and they fell in love, uh, she resigned from the job so that he could continue his diplomatic career. He was already the employee uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland. They met, they fell in love like wonderfully. Um, but yet she decided to, to give up on her career. The embassy of France was very sad, but they decided that this is the way to go. Uh, and that the Dutch Robert needed to get the um, um, the consent of the Minister of Foreign Affairs to to marry her. It was not that easy, you know. Like diplomats needed to have consent because she was associated with a foreign embassy. So, you know, like we are on, on duty all the time, even now in our private matters, apparently. Um, and then, you know, they, they moved to, to Rome, they, then they moved to Portugal as diplomats. I mean, Tadeusz as a professional diplomat, she as a spouse and then to Tokyo. And in Tokyo, uh, she was already uh, the mother of three ch daughters. Um, and this is where they actually, they upgraded the status of the embassy. I mean, from the Poselstvo to the embassy, from the legacy to the embassy. And this is where the, the outbreak of the World War II uh, caught them. Uh, and within the within two years, during two years, they um, they accepted their over 2000 uh, refugees who escaped Europe, I mean, Poland, through mm. the Soviet Union, and they managed to, to get to Japan. I don't know how, it's just in, incredible and from my perspective, impossible to do. Um, they had over 2000 refugees there in Tokyo. So they established the Polish committee to aid the victims of war and Zofia became the head of this com committee. And they were helping these over 2000 refugees um, who in 97% were Jewish, were Polish Jews. And they sent over 2000 of them out of Japan because they arrived there with very, you know, like short term visas issued by uh, Consul Sugihara and they saved over 2000 people there. Then they moved to when, when you know, the, the situation became more and more complicated, they moved to Shanghai and then uh, they moved to South Africa. Um, and from there, Tadeusz was sent to, to, to the Soviet Union and she stayed there for over a year with th three daughters on her own with the nanny. They had a wonderful nanny. She stayed there for, th for over a year, a year, not seeing her husband who she knew the Bolsheviks because she was attacked by Bolsheviks in Tichinice, so she knew them, but he was sent to, to, to the USSR to, to serve as our ambassador there. And she stayed there in South Africa for over a year with three daughters. As an activist of the Red Cross, she was still helping um, our army men who apparently were also sent at some point to South Africa, God, God knows how and why, um, with her three daughters and the nanny, they were sa saving people there as well. Uh, and they were trying to keep in touch with Tadeusz Romer. You can read the letters that he was sending to her, they are published. And this is just one of the most wonderful correspondence I have ever read because they have, when, when he was in Russia, uh, in the Soviet Union, they were married for, you know, like almost 20 years already. And they were still, still calling each other, Moja Zhutuś Najmilsza and my beloved uh -huh. Tadziu. Uh, and, you know, it was just so That's moving. It, it was very sweet and they were just like that for over 50 years of their marriage before their passing he passed a couple of years earlier than her passed away um, so from south africa they, they finally met in london because you know when when the situation got nasty after the cutting the, the, the cutting massacre was revealed mm. that those went back to went, went to london he was waiting for them there he became the minister and he wouldn't be able to survive all that without his family, without these letters from Zofia and without being touched, you know, I don't know how letters were going through uh, during World War II when, you know, the whole world was on fire, but they were keeping in touch all the time. And they stayed there in London also in 1945 when he got a heart attack and she, she needed to treat him and she was a sister of mercy, so she knew how to do it. She kept, kept him alive. And they understood that they will never be able to come back to Poland because uh, communists took over and they were still all the time together, uh, all the time keeping things together. At, this, at some point they decided to move to, to Montreal and, and they started a new chapter there. 
it was one of the saddest moments in their life, but they managed to keep things together, keep the family together. They emigrated together with the three daughters, their families, but Teresa, the oldest one, already had a family. With the nanny, they, they, they have been with, uh, together with their nanny until her passing. She passed away, Maya Hubish, at the, end of, uh, at the age of 102, I think. So they were you know, very close with each other for the, for the whole, um, for whole life. Um, and I'm in touch with Teresa Romer, uh, with their daughter, and I'm planning to make a video about Sofia Romer um, and to tell her story because apparently she doesn't even have a bio on Wikipedia. And when you search for, for her in our national archive, you cannot find anything about the name Sofia Romer but you can find many pictures where she's uh, signed down as the wife of Ambassador Romer. So without her name, but with her official role as a spouse. And I would love to change that. I would love her to, to have her name in you know, all the archives because she was a wonderful woman who saved together with her husband, with all the employees of our embassy in Tokyo and many people of goodwill, they saved over 2000 people Amazing. all together and they, Yes, and, and she has a wonderful, wonderful story. I'm still learning how to say it because she was also a private person. So it's really important to, to understand that um, some people do not like to be put into the spotlight, right? So we need yes. to respect some borders as well. Um, and she was not, you know, in a way she was official because she was a spouse, but um, she didn't have like the official role uh, to, to be spoken about. So it's really difficult to find sometimes these borders not to cross some, some, some frontiers that should not be crossed or maybe the family would not like yeah, to be right, crossed. Right. But we're well, in touch with Teresa and trying to. And, and Katarzyna, you're a great um, storyteller, actually. And um, the fact that you can recite all these facts, uh, you know, um, uh, from, from memory, memory are quite amazing. But I wanted to um, now switch gears a little bit and talk to Kate. Kate, uh, do you remember where we met and when? We met in Warsaw a few years ago, right. three, four years ago now. Maybe that we could travel. <laughs> and let, let me let me tell you a secret. I thought you were very inspirational. I thought you were very intimidating. You know, a lady lawyer from from yeah yeah yeah. So then I reached out to you, and uh, we we actually met, and you were so welcoming and open and warm. Um, and I, I was just amazed that, you know, we just sort of bumped into each other at a, at a conference in Warsaw and um, the rest is history. But um, tell us a bit more about what you do, because you have um, a very thriving legal practice and uh, you've been super busy. So we're very grateful for your time today that you've been able to, um, to spend with us. But what do you do and who is your inspirational Polish woman? Okay, so first of all, I would like to say that I'm a great fan of Polaron and what you do, word word, in um, in uh, making Polish history, Polish culture more accessible to the masses on a global level. So regardless how busy I may be, I will always make time. So thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I am a commercial lawyer. I am I'm a partner of a city law firm. Um, I work predominantly with men. That's why any successful women, uh, Polish or any other professional women whom I meet, uh, I'm very interested in their, in their story because there's always more to it uh, than meet the eye. Um, and we have very inspirational women nowadays. We listen to Michelle Obama. We read Becoming, we know how difficult it was for her to and how hard she worked to be where she was and so on. But we often forget about, you know, women who um, maybe maybe paved the way for us uh, in a way or were the trailblazers years ago. And the woman uh, I've chosen today, although it was difficult because there are lots of inspirational Polish women, and I'm so grateful that we get to talk about them. Uh, but I've chosen Mara Curie and of uh, and well, and I thought everybody would be talking about her because uh, I like uh, Katarzyna's choice. Uh, everybody knows Maria Curie Skłodowska for you know the first that she that she was. She was the first woman to ever receive the Nobel Prize, the first woman to have a Nobel Prize uh, twice to have it into fields because she got it in physics and, and, and then in chemistry. Um, 
She was the first woman to become a um, the professor of Sorbonne, um, the first woman ever buried in Panthenon. So there's a lot of firsts in her life. And this is all we know. We know about Maria Curie's, Maria Curie's charity, about her work for um, science and medicine, um, curing cancer, or battle, battle with cancer. Uh, but it's very interesting to put it in context of when she was born and where she was born, because she was born, um, she was born in Poland in the 19th century. Um, and I'm saying Poland, but geographically it wasn't even true because Poland was partitioned between three other countries. So it was a non-existent Poland. Um, she came from an um, educated family of scientists and, and uh, teachers, but her, her scientific progression was limited uh, by the fact that of the place where she was born and the fact that she was a woman. As a woman, she couldn't study at the university. So, and this is one of the things that I really liked about her. And when I read and studied her, she was very resourceful. To come to France, she, she made the deal with her elder sister. Her elder sister went to France uh, to kind of prepare the way to study medicine, but to prepare the way for Marie as well. Marie at the time worked as a teacher in Poland and sent her money to found herself. Later, when her elder sister was kind of established, she invited Marie to come and, uh, and Marie started, uh, started studying um, in, in France. And she always come, we, we have a picture, we have her pictures in here with, with her daughters. And also the, uh, the picture um, at the bottom is a picture with, um, which was taken at the Solvay Conference of Quantum Mechanics, where she was the only, the only woman because there was, there was a thing, she was always or very often the only woman to found herself in a scientific male dominated uh, um, uh, society. Uh, she always fought for being, uh, being taken and being considered for her merits, for her knowledge, for her discoveries. But what she actually had to fight was all the time is, was the fact that she was a woman. And there was her, there was the break, there was something that, that, that the main, uh, main obstruction. Um, when she started working uh, on, uh, when she said that she thinks there is, there are some new elements that haven't been discovered and, you know, haven't been included in the Mendeleev table of uh, elements, um, lots of scientists laugh, laughed at her. Mendeleev her, himself, came to check what she was doing. It was quite interested and, and actually gave a seal of approval because he said, well, this is the, why there are spaces in my table because there is a possibility of making, of finding the new elements. But when she, when she was working on it, she wasn't taken seriously. It was her husband, Pierre, who got interested in, in her work and started working together with her. And for four years, they worked in horrendous conditions trying to separate the, the, new, the new element from the ore of uranium, which involved um, shifting and, and breaking tons and tons of this, of this ore. Um, and uh, when, they discovered, when they discovered the new elements, polonium and radium, polonium was called uh, uh, polonium because of Poland, because she was always very close to, the, to her country, her native country, she always tried to help Poland. Um, and radium from Latin meant a uh, ray of sunshine because of its radioactivity. And a fun fact, she was the, the person who actually introduced the name radi radioactivity uh, and radioactive. So she, she, she's invented this name and the work for the work on ra radioactivity, she got her first Nobel Prize in uh, 1903. But again, she wouldn't be given this Nobel Prize if it wasn't for Pierre, who got the invitation to, to Sweden by the, um, by the Academy uh, to receive this Nobel Prize. And he said, no, because the credit is shared between the two of us. We, are, we were in partnership and, um, and uh, we both should get it. And this is another thing about them. It's the partnership. Uh, she, 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 she herself, 
said she would never be able to do this without him. He would never be, do, uh, be able to do it uh, without her. So this partnership in which they work together, they share the childcare together. I mean, it is it was very forward thinking for these times. Nowadays, we say, oh, we share the, our uh, duties and, uh, and childcare with our husbands. But we are the first generation. So our parents didn't do it. But then yet the curious did it um, over 100, 100 years ago. When her husband died, she uh, again faced a lot of hardship because uh, even, even with the Nobel Prize, she was always reduced to the assistant of uh, the Professor Curie, even though she was a professor herself. Um, uh, she continued working on, on, on radio, 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 radio. Uh, and for this, she got another Nobel Prize, uh, this time in, uh, in chemistry, and she did it herself. But she almost not got it again because of an affair she had with another scientist. And this affair was, again, I'm thinking it's like um, current paparazzi is kind of blowing it out of proportion. Uh, there was a massive smear campaign against her and, and there was pressure for her to go back to Poland. She was, she was called um, a dirty Pole who invented, um, who invented poison. And, uh, and, and Polish institutions really encouraging her to go back to Poland and, and leave France behind. But she said, no, my work's here. I need to continue with my work. So she almost not got her second novel. And even when she got it, she got an invitation, well, she got an acknowledgement, but uh, on the invitation, they said, well, don't come because uh, you will, uh, it will create you know, more havoc, so please don't come. But yet she did go. She says, no, I want my, my, my place at the table. I've earned it. I've discovered it. I am, I am going. Um, so it is very interesting that she worked so hard and she got so little, uh, so little recognition just because she was uh, she was a woman and this is why I find it find it so so inspirational because she kept going when the during the and I'll be finishing <laughs> quickly sorry because I have so much to say about right. <laughs> um, during the first world war she came out with the idea of uh, bringing a uh, mobile radiography equipment to the battlefield to help surgeons uh, treat the soldiers. She didn't have money for this and the French government were not interested in giving her the money. She was really, really lobbying for, for the money. She said, well, these are my, uh, my um, uh, Nobel Prize medals, they're made of gold, use them, let's. And, and you know, the thing of funding things herself was another, um, another pattern in her life. When she discovered radium, she didn't apply for a, a patent. And as a lawyer, I found it, I know she did it for altruistic uh, 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 causes because she wanted it to be accessible to science, science and medicine, but it is outrageous. The more that radium was, was met with so much enthusiasm, there was a radiomania. You could have advertisements, they were selling to, toothpaste and, and anti-wrinkle creams with radium. And it went massive. She would be very, very wealthy. But instead, all her life, she was lobbying to get money to fund research uh, and to fund more, you know, uh, more improvements to medical and scientific fields. And um, those little cars that are uh, little vans, which were called petite curies, uh, helped over a million uh, million soldiers during the First uh, World War. And even then she didn't have a recognition uh, from, uh, from the French government. It was after it went more global and she was had by feminists in, uh, in America where she went to give lectures and again, raise money for radium. So the element that she, she, she discovered herself she then had to lobby to get money to continue her research on it. And then she got the money. It was $100,000 for one gram of radium. She came back from America for, with two grams of radium. She founded radium uh, institutes both in, uh, in France and in Poland. And her work in um, uh, progressing, pioneering 
uh, those discoveries uh, in, um, in uh, uh, science and, and in medicine. Obviously, we know the effects, we, we know how important it was, but also she kept on training people. Her institute um, had three more, uh, three more Nobel Prize winners. And she also made a point of training women so the women have access to education. So this is why I'm, I'm saying that she really paved the way for uh, current feminists. And, uh, and, and this is why we, we should uh, really uh, appreciate her, her more. Sure, and, uh, sure. and if she was, if she was alive ra ra na right now, nowadays, she would be quoted for her inspirational thoughts as well. No, that's amazing. And look, we will um, go on to um, Olga's uh, inspiration of honor. But before I do that, I wanted to pick up on a, on a point that you made, that she's someone that's super famous. But I don't think a lot of people know that she was Polish, right? What are we to do about that other than doing um, seminars like this? Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that uh, people often assume that she was French, right? Well, uh, both countries, Poland and France, are very eager to <laughs> <laughs> claim her claim as, her. Uh, as well native, her. obviously, because of her, her achievements. Uh, and because she is so internationally, internationally known, and her name is French, this is why she is considered French. But, um, you know, her education, her family started in Poland, and she always had those close, uh, close links. And in fact, Poland recognized her... Um, uh, her achievement much more quicker than France uh, because she got some um, titles in the Polish universities even before she got, she was, uh, for instance, um, uh, in, um, made a member of the French Institute of, uh, of the Scientists. So, yeah, we have to have more events like this. Absolutely. And next time I'm in London, whenever that is, we've got a topic to talk about. Olga, we also met um, because I went to visit your uh, wonderful institute and you are a cur curator. So curators are essentially what? Are they in charge of preserving memories? Um, um, tell us about your work and who is your inspirational woman, Olga, please? Curator is a tricky thing because you might be a curator of a particular collection or you can be a curator of a project. Uh, what I do mostly the best and what I like doing most is conceptualize projects, uh, think of where an object or a story can lead me and then present it to the public, uh, which, is, which I enjoy the most. Um, I uh, have a lot of inspirational uh, women um, to talk about. However, today I would like to concentrate uh, on one uh, who um, made a huge impression on me and she's not a famous person. Uh, I was very impressed with what Katarzyna and Kate uh, um, told us um, and I would like to uh, comment on uh, two things. Uh, Katarzyna, you said that um, women are often written out of official na na narrative. For example, you were specifically talking about diplomacy and history. And Kate, you said uh, a similar thing uh, that um, some of the women even were not uh, given a credit for their work. Uh, this is uh, where my project, um, Polish women, forgotten force Polish women uh, in the Second World War started a few years ago. Because when I was going through our archives, I, I've noticed that there are no women in the archive. I mean, we have quite a substantial archive, but uh, the amount of uh, archival material regarding women is very small uh, in comparison for, uh, with the full body of our archive. And the stories uh, which the women were telling, even in the small part of the archive there is, they were usually talking about their husbands, their sons, they were given the materials of, uh, uh, of their achievements and they were not talking about themselves. So I realized that we are having a gap uh, in the official historical narrative. We are writing the history with the big H uh, whether women are somewhere on the margins. And I do not even talk about the women with big achievements, which sometimes 
we get a glimpse of their lives, uh, whether it will be a spouse uh, uh, of a diplomat, a diplomat or a scientist, which a lot of credit should go to them. However, there are a lot of women who are everyday heroes and uh, the men who do heroic things in their everyday lives are um, celebrated for this, where our women are not. So what we did uh, was go and talk to um, six amazing ladies who um, reside today uh, in London. They are all over uh, 90s, 90 years old, uh, and they moved here during um, the Second World War. Uh, majority of them, five of them, uh, were deported uh, from Poland to the Soviet Union uh, during um, Russian invasion of Poland uh, in 1939, and, it, and they went through horrible things. I would like to concentrate on one of the ladies, Irena Godin. Um, for many years in London, she was known as the wife of Rotmistrz Godin, who was a, a Polish historian and military officer and also ornithologist. Uh, Irena, um, was deported to um, Soviet Union when she was 13. She was just a child and she was report, you know, deported with her entire family. Here you can see all the um, wonderful ways you would talk to. Irena is one on the top, in the top left corner. She is absolutely optimistic and amazing woman of 95 right now. You wouldn't say, uh, looking at her and talking to her, um, what she went through uh, during her life. As I said, she was deported with her siblings. She had two sisters and a brother, father and mother. Uh, they traveled for six weeks and end ended up in the Ir Irkutsk area of Soviet Union. As she remembers, uh, this was the furthest placement that could be uh, for the people who were um, forcibly removed from their homes, because she was born in uh, Grodno and at the age uh, of 13, she participated uh, in a battle of Grodno. As she remembers, they put together bottles, uh, put fuels in the bottles and they were trying to throw them in the Russian tanks, um, towards the Russian tanks. It took about a week uh, for the Grodno to fall, to fall down. And as a result, uh, as Irena's uh, father was uh, previously involved uh, in uh, during First World War with uh, Piłsudski's um, army, uh, the legions, and later on he was a famous officer, um, their family was treated particularly badly during the deportation. During her stay, her holiday, as she sometimes says, uh, in the Soviet Union, she lost her father, uh, she lost her mother, she lost her younger sister, and um, when she realized uh, that uh, they are going to um, look for the Anders army to, um, they were given the opportunity uh, to move with the Anders, um, with Anders army to um, Middle East. Uh, the entire family then still alive took the opportunity. They died on their way of hunger. Irena was, um, separated from their siblings and left with the younger one who at that point had a broken back um, due uh, to her horrible work um, as a slave uh, worker in uh, Siberia. So two girls were trying to reach the hospital uh, in Bukhara uh, where they uh, knew their uh, mother was lying ill and the another sister with typhoid was lying ill. So what Irena did, I when she told me this story for the first time, I couldn't believe it. She was 13, her younger sister was 11. The little one with the broken back couldn't walk. So Irena left her hidden in the, in the bushes uh, at the side road and went by herself around 100 miles. This is Irena and her siblings uh, at the bottom uh, on the right side. 
She went 100 miles alone without food, without water, stealing um, what she could uh, from uh, wherever she could find it. And there was enormous hunger at the time uh, in the Soviet Union. And she finally reached Buhara. She said that the first person she walked into was one standing in the queue to the Polish garrison in Bukhara, which was amazing. She, she celebrates it's like a, a God-given event. They went back and they found their sister, her sister, and thanks to her, she survived for uh, survived this passage. Sadly, she later on also passed away, leaving uh, Irena only with another sibling and um, and the boy who's seen her, uh, who later on served in Yunaki. This everything, when Irena told me this in his uh, beautiful attire, you can see here it's Tubitieka, it's uh, a traditional uh, attire uh, of um, Uzbekistan. She was given it uh, as a token of appreciation by men when she went uh, back to Uzbekistan uh, in the 90s uh, and told her story to everyone over there, everyone was crying. And this is a male garment she is wearing right now, only given, uh, except for the headdress, only given to the mo most worthy people. So she was given this by the representative of Uzbekistan, uh, telling her that she remains in, the, in their hearts. This actually was not the end of Irena's story. She uh, went through Middle East. She went down with tuberculosis. She went down with uh, typhoid. She survived everything and managed to bring her siblings to the United Kingdom. Uh, we've talked with Irena for uh, many, many hours. She was, she is such a lovely person. She's 95 at the moment. She uh, goes around Polish schools uh, and um, talks to children. They give her gifts because she's, she has such an enormous spirit. When she moved uh, to the United Kingdom, she spoke Arabic, she spoke Russian, uh, she spoke a bit of German. Uh, because her father at some point said that languages are uh, is your capital. So you have to speak languages so that you can find your place in the world. And she listened. Till today, she can, uh, at 95, she can speak a little bit of, of each of these languages. When her husband died uh, around 30, no, 40 years ago already, she was left with three children and a house that was not paid in full. So she worked three jobs to support herself and support everyone else in her family. Right now, she said that she had a horrible life, but she has a wonderful, um, all, uh, she, she has a wonderful life at the 95 and she's still very spright and strong. At 90, the entire street in London where she lives in Cashelton, threw her a party and they danced on the street. It was not a pandemic at the moment, so everyone uh, could celebrate her wonderful life. Um, she's only one of uh, the participants of our project. And um, as you may notice, her life uh, story, she didn't do a great things but she managed to keep, keep her family together. She managed to survive and she managed, she still manages to bring a little bit of Poland into the United Kingdom. And she's very inspirational um, for all the young people sh uh, who uh, talk to her. Um, she can be an example of what a life, a good life can be. And this is what should be celebrated. Uh, I um, on the last note, I will uh, just go back to what Katarzyna and Kate said, um, because uh, when I was looking through uh, her albums, even she does this mistake that every man in her picture is signed and she is not, and the ladies are not signed. This is what happens also in our archive, which is very difficult to um, 
uh, then give names to all the wives or all the military officers. And um, the last slide I showed you uh, was, a, um, was a painting by a very inspirational artist and conservator Zofia Pushomiska Noga, who did um, artworks for our project. And this is a, a painting of um, Irena Godin, and there are other paintings by Zofia, who is also featured here. Zofia worked in the Royal Institution. Here I go to what um, Kate and Katarzyna said. And in the Royal Institution, she took care of uh, um, the scientists' uh, archives. And she went through a lot of photographs of the noblest uh, prize winners, because the Royal Institution is the institution for scientists uh, since, the 17th, uh, since the 18th century. None of the women were given names. All of the men were given names. So this is what I want to say. Let's celebrate women and let's remember the names. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Olga. And I think we've talked about, um, uh, well, some of the women that we spoke of are kind of quiet achievers and we don't know how to claim that fame. Um, we don't necessarily know how to um, emphasize our achievements. But I kind of, uh, I don't want to say that I, I, I left the best for last, but I wanted to introduce someone who's not Polish, well, Ivana is, but she's going to talk about someone who was an adopted Pole. Over to you, Ivana. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today, um, Eva. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, and uh, I already had an honor to uh, be on your program, Polarance program, before talking about the lady who I'm going to talk about today, who is Lady Ryder of Warsaw. And um, I um, uh, represent a Polish Sioux, and behind me, you can probably see the um, logo. Um, so uh, we started in memory of Lady Ryder of Warsaw, Sue Ryder, because we believe that she is so inspirational um, and that we definitely wanted to bring her to the wider audience and explain who she was. Um, and also, um, you know, follow to some extent, follow her in the way that uh, she um, influenced um, our lives. Um, so, um, uh, who is Polish Sioux? Uh, Polish Sioux is the, um, uh, a non-profit uh, social action organization um, that, uh, as I mentioned, I've uh, started in uh, 2016 in London uh, in memory of Suraida. Um, and our aim uh, is basically to promote uh, ideas of charity, social empathy, and good Polish-British relations. Um, we don't have a website yet, but yes, we will uh, soon have it, uh, hopefully. Um, however, you can follow us on Twitter, website, um, uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so um, before I start, I would like to say thank you very much to my, um, uh, to, to Katarzyna, to Kate and to Olga, because I can in many ways relate to the ladies that you just described today. Um, First of all, thank you for introducing uh, the, uh, um, the Polish diplomat, um, uh, Pani Romerowa, absolutely amazing character. Um, Maria kiris Kłodowska, I personally uh, studied at the UMCS in Lublin, that was my alma mater in Poland, and uh, I have a lot of affinity to uh, Maria kiris Kłodowska, and I absolutely agree, she's a, not very well known across as a Polish woman, but generally, but generally uh, people uh, actually just use Curie, so the French surname. So this is a great opportunity, Kate, that you brought in uh, her um, to, to, to this program today. And finally, Olga, I really, really um, am very grateful that you brought in um, Irena Godin today uh, to this program because um, I very much um, feel for um, uh, Irena. I, I actually personally met uh, Irka Swomnitska who you have uh, also mentioned, and uh, Marjana Scheibel, uh, who, by the way, was a, a great uh, character. Um, she was playing a, a very uh, important role during the Warsaw Uprising, uh, where she was also uh, working as a sanitariuszka, so she was a, a medical help. So uh, all these ladies, absolutely amazing. Um, they went through a lot and, and they actually can represent the Polish history just by following their uh, 
characters. You can learn so much about Polish history after the war. So thank you for that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Surai, the Baroness Rider of Warsaw. Um, who was the Baroness uh, Rider of Warsaw? She was basically a British activist with a Polish heart. And that has to be said, um, she felt a very affiliated with Poland throughout all her life. And I will talk a little bit more about this. Um, she was concerned with helping sick disabled people all across many countries. Um, but her heart was really with Poland where she started working with a, a very early age. She was only 17 when she joined um, the Polish section of what you call a COE, Special Operations Executives, um, after the war, uh, or sorry, during the war. And um, she was actually helping out the uh, uh, Chief of um, the Silent Unseen, the Special Polish Forces, um, as part of the SOE's um, activities. She was preparing them to secret sabotage missions um, uh, across um, German occupied Europe, uh, and um, that included Poland during the um, Warsaw Uprising. Um, and this is when she started really liking Poland, and she really liked the, the fact that uh, the Polish uh, Chichoczemi she has met uh, uh, admired, you know, she admired them for, for the values they, they had and they pro projected, which was Bóg, Honor, and Ojczyzna. These are the three values that um, uh, she was. Um, very, very um, um, impressed by. And um, she noticed that a lot of people, um, you know, the Chicho Chemni had a, a great love for the country. Um, so um, during the war, she, she had uh, um, also worked a lot. Um, and just after the war, she worked as in a humanitarian aid. Uh, she worked with many Polish people who were called so-called misplaced people. Um, and these are the people who, um, uh, who basically after the war lost their families and they were prisoners in concentration camps. Uh, a lot of them had uh, never found um, their families. They had no money. She was organizing um, uh, some kind of medical help for them. She was always finding shelter for them. And also she was organizing um, um, holidays for those people who could not uh, afford um, and who were very traumatized after the war. It has to be said, they just couldn't afford to go anywhere. And, um, and she had uh, her first home who she started in 53. She actually invited those people to her own home that she turned into her first care home. And that was um, uh, back in uh, early, early 1950s. So uh, during this work, um, during the war and, and straight after the war, she had a great exposure to Polish society, to Polish people. Um, and then she's decided that uh, I'm going to start a foundation dedicated uh, to helping Polish people in Poland. Um, and this is when she actually started um, her own uh, home um, in Poland in Konstantin Jorna. Uh, which was the first care home uh, that she started in Poland. Um, Ivana, I do have to ask you why you got so inspired by her and um, what, you, what got you interested in, in Polish Sue? Well, well first, first of all, um, you know, she was one of these ladies who was very strongly convict, convinced to bring um, some goodness after the war, you know, she wanted to do a lot of uh, good deeds to the people who, uh, you know, to the population of people who were totally lost after the war. She also was one of the people, one of the ladies, in fact, the only lady I, I know of was at this sort of scale, who would open um, this idea of charity and uh, in the UK, she actually opened about 450 home uh, charity shops uh, that uh, are still now working and operational. Um, and uh, all across the world, she would, she would open about 80 homes, uh, care homes. Out of them, 30 would, would be based in Poland. So, um, 
you know, she's absolutely convinced that um, charity um, would help to improve society. And, and th that, that was my inspiration. I also had a, um, a chance to meet her through my family as well, who knew Surida personally. And um, uh, we, we knew of her deeds, we knew of, of what she was doing. We, we knew that she was incredibly involved in Poland um, and um, uh, during the martial law specifically, she was helping a lot. Um, she was sending tons of medicine, um, uh, clothing um, and all kinds of uh, help to Poland. You know, there were lorries and lorries of uh, help that she would organize and send. Um, she was working very closely with Baroness Cox um, and also with a Polish charity, um, ladies who were involved in the medical fund of Poland, like, um, uh, you know, th this is the organization that was organized by, um, by Polish, Polish charity. So, you know, she was very much involved in this and she was also involved in uh, bringing a good name of Poland in front of the British audience. And she was um, um, working closely in the parliament with uh, Lords, uh, she was part, she was obviously uh, working as a, uh, in a in the House of Lords to um, to bring the attention of what has happened in Poland in uh, uh, onto the world stage in 81 right. the martial law and um, um, she was fighting for uh, for the attention for bringing um, the important issues of Polish people and of freedoms of Polish people to the British Parliament so. Um, when she was offered um, a title of um, lady of, uh, she was to uh, she was to choose which place, and um, she actually chose Warsaw. So this is the way that she became the lady of Warsaw, and she was offered the lordship to uh, by the queen, and uh, and this was again to bring uh, Poland and Warsaw to the attention of the British public. Amazing, um, ladies, the message is clear. We need to support each other more, speak of our achievements more. And what else, Katarzyna? What else can we do to make this situation that we all spoke of, that we are overachievers but underappreciated um, more to the fore? What is it that we should do? Well, simply speak up, uh, you know, and sometimes self invite ourselves to, um, to many events and. I don't know, to the media, there is a broad discussion among my friends working in the field of, of foreign policy, uh, especially analysts. Um, and they feel that, you know, like that they are not invited often enough to the media to speak about, you know, their expertise and their field. And their male colleagues are in, being invited more often. And it happens in, in many fields, uh, you know, not only foreign policy, but, you know, like media is, is, is like is a place where, you know, probably the change should start with because, you know, like media is being watched and observed and read by the, the, the biggest number of people. So I would say, and I need to say that I sometimes do it as well, not, not with the media, but with some other outlets, and especially in the times of social media, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, getting a little bit different, you know, just, uh, if they do not send you an invitation, just try to, you know, get to Shut the up. window sometimes. Right. Yeah, why not? And, you know, we, we have many interesting things to say, many important things to say, many important stories to share. Uh, if I just may add one thing regarding yeah. to what Olga said, that is very, very important uh, what, what Olga is doing. And I'm, I, I know her project and I'm very amazed by that to speak about the, the stories um, exactly, not from high politics only, but also the stories that were happening in the background and the stories of ordinary people, because we will not understand what the history, if we focus only on the top of it, if we focus only on the behind the closed doors meetings of the you know giants of, of, of global politics. If we want to understand what was really happening then um, and what is really happening right now as well, we need to speak about the history of ordinary people too. And usually women were in the background, were, were in this, you know, like more ordinary life, but it doesn't mean that they were less brave, not at all. No, and Katarzyna, some of us, if the media don't want us, we create our own media, right? Uh, we've been yeah. so successful at creating our own um, social channels that are super popular.
Kate, I have to tell you that um, your presentation has really inspired me because, you know, everybody knows who um, Marie Curie, uh, Skodowska Curie is, but you do have such a passion. So give us your parting word. What can we as women do um, in this, you know, Polish Heritage Month, in this life of ours that's full of COVID and all kinds of challenges? What is it that we can do uh, to rise above? I mean, when I was thinking about Marie Curie, I also thought kind of identified three P's about her, like P for passion, passion for her work, P for per per persistence, because she never stopped. She didn't pay attention, you know, to uh, the critics, you know, the haters. She, uh, she encountered so many haters, but she had this, this goal, you know, her passion dr driven her. And, and partnership. And it was a partnership with her husband, but also partnership um, and support from other women. And, and I think this is something that we should take into account. And also, um, like Katarzyna said, well, invite ourselves, but also yeah. support other, other women and uh, uh, in their encounters, in, in, in their achievement, uh, um, you know, cheer them up. Um, and also, if I can say I'm also a co-founder for Women's Business Link, and it is an organization which aims at, uh, at uh, supporting women's progress in professionally uh, and, and, and personally as well. And we, we, we want to be cheerleaders for other women. So um, I think the way forward. Yeah, and that's so very important. Olga, I'll um, go to you now. I, I don't know if you remember when we met, uh, I mentioned um, a lady in Perth here in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Who, yes. Um, walked from Persia to East Africa. Uh, you know, she was part of the this group of, of people that were displaced by Siberia. They ended up um, who knows where. Um, and when I came back to Australia, I reached out to her son because you know I spoke to this lady once, and she left Poland at the age of three, and she spoke this most beautiful, a little bit archaic, but just priceless, beautiful Polish. But when I got back, unfortunately, I found out that she's died. So with your project um, or the glimpse of which we, we got um, to see today, you are preserving people's memories. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, where can we see, um, is, is this exhibition um, still happening? And, and um, what is it um, that we, where, where can we find more information about this wonderful women's that are, women that are unsung heroes, I guess? So um, before pandemic happened, we were supposed to do a celebratory uh, event in the Polish embassy uh, that sadly uh, did not happen uh, because we just went into lockdown on a day, literally on a day. <laughs> so uh, this was a bit unfortunate. However, we put together an exhibition, uh, an online exhibition, uh, which is called uh, Art and Memory. And it's a very easy uh, at the, um, a link to find it just www.artandmemory.uk so we can uh, go to this link and see uh, the artworks which were uh, done around the project and uh, read the uh, short stories of all the women however we provisionally have booked uh, in exhibition space in a POSC gallery in Polish Cultural Association um, building for the second half of July, two weeks. And hopefully, fingers crossed, if nothing else happens, we will be exhibiting the project there for two weeks. So I will uh, share the invitation online on our social media and I definitely will keep you posted. No, that's amazing. And if there's any dancing on the street going on, you know, like send me the invite, right? Um, Ivana, the last word goes to you because we have run out of time. Um, so we've got like half a minute, but please um, tell us um, where can we find, and we show, you showed us um, your social media channels and the website that's being um, done, but where can we find out a bit more information? Because there's also a museum in Poland, right, which I went to visit. Uh, you see, I, I go everywhere. I, I'm one of those people that, you know, the doors close, I go through the window. Um, so just lastly and, and qu quickly, I'm so sorry, but we've run out of time. Uh, where can we find Polish Sue? Uh, where can we find more information? So basically, um, one thing I would like to recommend is that you start reading this book. And uh, if you can see, uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but this is the autobiography oh, yeah. of Sue Ryder, 
called, uh, is, there's a book called Child of My Love. And so right there, Rob, this, this is exactly the story. It's a very, it's a quite thick book, but you can see. But uh, this is a story that uh, uh, she described herself about what she was doing. And um, um, another, another good source of information is um, uh, Museum Sura of Surider in Warsaw, oh. who I worked with quite closely. We had um, in 2019, as part of um, the uh, uh, Polish Heritage Days, um, we had uh, the uh, uh, film and uh, an exhibition in POS uh, together with the museum. At the Museum of Surider is, uh, is based in Warsaw, um, in Platz Uni Lubelskiej, and so are the um, uh, the, the home, uh, the, the charity shop, which is in Bagatella Street. So, if you have any spare clothes uh, in Warsaw, um, you know, bring bring them on, and we, you can also buy clothes and and different um, different things from the from the shop. And in this way, you are supporting the uh, charity um, of Surider, which is you know. Um, has a very deep roots in Poland, as I mentioned, with over 30 care homes still are operational in uh, in Poland. So um, I would also, um, you know, um, uh, advi advise that you follow my uh, my social media <laughs> because I do post from time to time different stories, and um, I hope that um, uh, you know that people will learn a, a lot more about Surider and what she did and. Talking about the persistence, she was one of a big persistent lady, I can tell you that. Wonderful. Ladies, we are done. We only got a little taste of you and a little taste of the women that inspire you, but I certainly feel inspired. So I'll see you in London, I'll see you in Tel Aviv, you can come to Melbourne, maybe next year, who knows. Um, but I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time, because you, I know that you're very busy and um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful that we got to hear about you. Um, so you also those quiet achievers, those un unsung heroes to me, uh, but also about women that inspire you. And let's keep the conversation going. Let's celebrate um, not just the Polish Heritage Day, but women and who we are and what we do. And let's support each other as Kate, Katarzyna, Olga, and also Ivana said. So thank you so very much. And hopefully we'll soon see you face to face whenever, whenever that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're invited <laughs> thank you so much, to celebrate everyone. too. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.